You're watching the Global Goal Studio. Dr. Tracy, let me go back to you. You talked about incentives. I would like to ask, what can we do to incentivize health workers to go where they're needed the most? I think that is uh, an incredibly important question, and I don't have a good answer. Um, you know, I feel that society, the values of society oftentimes go towards um, financial compensation and, and reward in that way. And in fact, in the history of medicine, uh, that's a very recent development. For, for hundreds of years, if not thousands, um, physician compensation was not the driving force or the motive for the uh, individuals who, who pursued that line, who pursued that, that passion, that line of work. Um, the the mission-driven component of medicine is, was always the, the most important thing to the most successful practitioners, whether it was physicians or nurses or allied health professionals. I think somehow we have to celebrate those individuals as champions. We did see that during COVID. We saw a celebration of humanity and the human spirit of people doing good by other people. And somehow I hope that that is like a Sputnik moment that persists. I hope it's something that sort of shakes up civilization, shakes up awareness that we can't get through this pandemic and then sit back on and go back to the old ways. We somehow have to celebrate the importance of helping others through medicine and science for the sake of helping others through medicine and science, not for compensation. Let me ask you, Dr. Tracy, Will the race for a vaccine displace other health priorities? Uh, of, ne of necessity, I think it already has. Um, we, for instance, um, at, at Northwell Health, where, where I work, uh, we shut down, which is the largest healthcare provider in New York City and state. So we were ground zero for the, for the surge in New York City. We shut down all of our clinical research trials, hundreds of trials for cancer, for um, inflammatory diseases, for um, cardiac diseases, um, on and on down the list. We shut them all down, um, primarily because they were um, being done in the context of people coming in for scheduled surgery and scheduled healthcare, and that was shut down. So yes, we lost seven to nine months of research in those other diseases. We've also now seen a redeployment of research support to our fundamental research infrastructure, whether it's in the laboratory or in clinical trials, the money is now being pushed appropriately so into the COVID response. But as I said before, I hope this is a wake up call, a Sputnik moment that we haven't kept pace in the United States anyways, with investing in research infrastructure for 17 years, we haven't kept pace with inflation. And I pray and I hope that this uh, importance of research and the importance of maintaining these investments in, in clinical trials and in basic science to discover new therapies. I hope that that now persists after the pandemic is behind us. Dr. Moraba, the coronavirus caught nearly the entire world off guard and, and it quickly proved, I think, that we are really unprepared for a global pandemic in spite of all of these years of planning. In hindsight, should we have been so surprised about how unprepared we are? What can we learn, in fact, from the missteps that we just made? I actually don't think we should have been surprised. Um, back in 2017, I spoke at Wired about uh, the impending reality of a global pandemic, um, and that was three years ago. And um, even then, it was very clear, um, just based on our previous experience with um, regionally localized pandemics, that we don't have the global infrastructure, we don't have the apparatuses, and unfortunately, we do tend to securitize health rather than recognize that it is built on primary health care, it's built on research, it's built on fundamentals. And, and we have to actually center, center it around human dignity and our right to access and quality of care. Not you know, closing borders and attempting um, you know, to negate, I, I think that the reality that viruses don't stop at customs in the airport, they can't sit down at a negotiation table. It's a fundamentally different conflict. Um, and it is one that needs to be looked at through a human and a humanitarian lens. Um, and that, that's something we've, you know, the global health community has been repeating since 2016, 2017. Um, and I, I will just underline something that Dr. Tracy said that I really appreciate. You know, COVID-19 has displaced without question the prioritization of other healthcare challenges. Um, and in many ways that is good, but in also in many ways that is detrimental to communities. 
uh, it is detrimental in countries where you know childhood vaccinations are the difference between that family having a cycle of education and income um, and really breaking a cycle of poverty. We know that there is a significant rise in poverty around the world. We know that girls are now out of school disproportionately even more. We'll have 10 million more girls out of school after this um, this pandemic at the, at the least. Um, and, and we know that this is having significant ramifications on those who live below the poverty line and in, in uh, developing countries. And so while it's important for us to recognize that yes, COVID-19 has, has re-energized health research, it has refocused it um, to the pandemic, we also need to understand that healthcare does not exist in a vertical. It is not a silo. Um, healthcare really means that people have what they can to eat and they don't have to choose between going out and working for the day um, and potentially getting this virus versus putting food on the table for their family. And so our, our healthcare infrastructure has to be looked at as more than just whether or not we have physicians and research. It needs to be looked at as can people live with dignity, basic dignity. And if they can't, we, we're all not doing enough. I, I couldn't agree more, Dr. Mirabet, that it's so critically important. And I couldn't agree more that this was not a surprise. Um, here you have the two of us we have not met before today. I also participated in a report at the White House in around 2007 after SARS-1. And the models that we constructed for this report, a small group of us, um, were, were based on a, a virus that was cont as, probably as contagious on paper as COVID is now but was about 10 times more lethal. And the result of that type of an infection would have killed about 40% of the United States and Canada within six months. And it would, have, it would have incapacitated, never mind a surge at the hospital, there wouldn't have been employees at the hospital. And we have made recommendations to stockpile PPE, antibiotics, intravenous fluids, and, um, uh, um, and respirators. So that the respirators we, we, just, we recommended would be small, almost disposable plastic respirators that would be deployed to schools and fire stations in the hopes that somebody would survive in the area to be able to deploy these things in a way that would be meaningful. And so these models were, are all in place. And I mean, this is just the two of us. We, we met today for the first time. But there are people who spend their life doing only these recommendations. So again, shame on shame on us for underfunding public health services, for under under public underfunding the CDC, underfunding local government health authorities that are the lifeblood of of a pandemic response, as as everybody seems to know now. And we cannot go back to those old ways. I couldn't agree more. Sadly, Dr. Tracy, Dr. Morabit, we have to leave it there. But thank you for joining us in the Global Goal Studio. Thank you so much Thank for you. We're gonna take a short break. We'll be right back uh, after this message. This year, teachers are learning new ways to teach. Parents are learning to lesson plan and young minds are learning a new normal. This year, we are all students. At Verizon, we're enabling the education that students deserve. With credentialed teacher training, free lesson plans for parents, and tech-enabled solutions for schools nationwide, it's Citizen Verizon in Action, our plan for economic, environmental, and social advancement. 